about ESCR and enforcement mechanisms. Now you've done this in the morning and the afternoon, so I'm going to just skim over this. Um, after the ratification of the UDHR, several United Nations mechanisms which had functions that allowed for enforcing and protecting ESCR came into being. Some of them, like you know that they're international treaties, you have related treaty bodies that you've talked about today, including the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Now they have they monitor implementation, but they also have what you could call a quasi-adjudicative role that they can look at complaints and communications and provide recommendations. Um, for our purpose, we won't dive into all of the possible enforcement mechanisms at the international level, but we will talk about something that is of much interest for lawyers, individual complaints. Sure. Um, is it? Okay. Um, so individual complaints, it breathes life into the more general and abstract norms of the UN and um, it gives it practical effect. So basically what happens is that an individual or say a community facing violations of its rights can bring a complaint to the treaty body against the state party in question and the treaty body will then go on to examine this violation. Now, as um, Ms. Heider um, um, referenced, most, almost all UN human rights treaties today have optional protocols. They have the ability to, under those optional protocols, to look at individual complaints or communications. Now, of all of these, and there are many, of all of these, um, kind of complaint mechanisms, one of the most relevant is the optional protocol to the ICESCR. It is one of the most um, comprehensive protections for the general protection of ESCR. Now, this is a huge development in the field because 42 years after the protections, the kind of complaint mechanisms for ICESCR came into practice, do we have this optional protocol for the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights? So there is a lot of hope from the communities, from the international community, that this will assist in the actual enforcement, better enforcement of um, economic, social and cultural rights. But it is quite new. It only came into force in 2013. And um, I think Ms. Heider talked about the optional protocol of CEDAW having 109 parties. We only have 20 under this new one, but there is hope and it is an exciting development. And if you go on to become international human rights attorneys and you're thinking about how to bring focus to an actual case, you don't necessarily have to always look at forums or bodies that have a proper adjudicative function. Sometimes you can go to the treaty bodies um, who also do periodic review of state obligations and you can um, assist um, civil society endeavors in um, giving shadow reports or maybe you'll work for the government and you'll be responsible for putting together reports for your state and seeing how you're able to better meet obligations, hopefully. And, um, or you could submit information to the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review System under the Human Rights Council. So there is a range of different ways in which the international, uh, at the international level you can think about judicial enforcement, you can use different forums to um, go for judicial enforcement. Under the regional level you have kind of the same system, you have treaties like say the European Convention on Human Rights and you have associated judicial and quasi-judicial bodies that give effect to those treaties. So these are some of them. Um, they, at the regional level, the human rights protections um, offer various opportunities and offer up a rich jurisprudence, particularly in Africa, in the Americas and Europe. So we're not going to go into that for lack of time, but um, we can discuss it in more detail during the discussion session. And then you have what is arguably a very, very important aspect of enforcement Human rights violations happen at the national level, right? 
So the national level forums are the first line of defense. And at the national level, judicial enforcement usually happens through courts, or they can happen through other kinds of tribunals. Um, you can have constitutional courts that look at these kind of decisions. You can have civil courts. You can have criminal courts. You can have specialized tribunals like administrative courts, children's and juveniles courts. It really depends on the country, how national judicial enforcement works out. Usually, ESCR is um, enshrined in the national constitution or in other pieces of legislation, sometimes it is not given judicial effect. And then attorneys have found ways in which to use civil and political rights to bring about judicial enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But um, how this works is important. And often national courts will look at international jurisprudence. They will look at committee decisions. They will look at um, observations um, made by the different judicial bodies internationally. And if they are a monist system, so you know monist versus dualist systems. In monist systems, international law directly has application once a state becomes a party to a treaty. In dualist systems, you need implementing legislation. But in monist systems, you have courts which directly will reference a particular um, treaty um, obligation and ask their state to meet it as part of their kind of national enforcement of these issues. Now, we will very quickly look at the idea. Now, you've all talked about treaties, and you all study law. So I know this is very, very basic for you. But before we dive into case law, we'll quickly look at rights, violations, and obligations. Now, you have normative rights, right? You have the treaty rights. And you have corresponding to that state obligations, right? A breach of obligations leads to violations of rights. Now, in understanding the nature of obligations, which is important if you're thinking about case law, um, these particular um, comments of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and principles and guidelines are very important. General Comment 3 talks about the nature of state obligation. General Comment 9 talks about the importance of domestic application of the covenant. Um, the Limburg principles on the implementation of ICACR talks about um, the nature and state of obligations. And Maastricht guidelines talks about the nature of um, what constitutes a violations. Now, violations of ESCR happen in, when we think about obligations, we have to think about it in terms of respect, protect, and fulfill. Now, you know these three, but we will look at them a bit carefully because when we look at the case law at international, regional, and national levels, we will be looking at it through the lens of these state obligations. So respect is means a state party should not interfere with the enjoyment of human rights. Protect, the obligation to protect is ensuring that third parties, non-state actors, do not infringe upon or interfere with the enjoyment of human rights. Fulfill means taking positive steps to realize human rights. So for example, if you look at the right to health, the obligation to respect would mean that a state party should not deprive a certain community, for example, from accessing healthcare facilities. Protecting would be, say there's a big multinational corporation, they are um, creating environmental degradation, releasing poisonous chemicals into the air. The state has an obligation to do something to change this, to stop this. And fulfill means, for example, the state should not just not interfere, they should also take steps to um, realize these rights, for example, by providing primary care or by providing clean water. Now, instead of going in depth, just to sum up some of the very important aspects of state obligation, you have, states have the obligation, they don't have to meet all their ESCR obligations all at once. They have to take progressive steps within the maximum available resources. Now, this is important. States often do not have the resources or capacity to meet some of these very difficult demands that the international human rights system puts on them. 
Also though, states often use this as a first excuse. They will say, look, we're sorry we can't meet XYZ obligation under the right to health, we don't have the budget for it. So another aspect of obligations is very important, that is you have to take progressive steps, but there are certain essential minimum levels of rights that you have to meet under international law, and this is regardless of resource constraints. So for example, non-discrimination is one such aspect. You have to um, provide access to minimum essential food levels, and so on and so forth. Now let's look at, we'll go into trends in the legal arena that kind of show developments in ESCR adjudication at the, at the different levels, international, regional, and um, national. So we'll, do, we'll go through a brief historical overview. Now, the swift trajectory of ESCR adjudication is remarkable because for most of the 20th century, there have only been very occasional judgments and decisions that directly adjudicate on ESCR, right? You do have, through statutory and through administrative law, social entitlements has been adjudicated, but ESCR as we understand it through our global human rights regime, that has been quite recent. So it's only in the last two decades or so um, that there has been massive developments in this field, and we went from occasional scattered decisions, say by certain international bodies like the ILO, or certain national jurisdictions like Germany and Argentina, um, we have seen now that there are probably over 200,000 international and constitutional decisions that have been made on ESCR. A recent study, not recent really, in 2008, tracked ESCR decisions in Brazil and there were over 10,000 cases. And um, this is mirrored in a multiple number of countries across the world, across legal systems. Now in terms of domestic adjudication, India and South Africa have captured international attention for their clear and compelling approach to enforcing ESCR. One of the things you will see at a country basis is that ESCR is often not given justiciable weight. What, um, what's interesting is that many lawyers in many countries have taken civil and political rights and they have tried to interpret it in a way that encompasses ESCR. So for example, um, in India, we, in our constitution, we have um, ESCR only as directive principles, as guidelines. But they've taken the right to life under civil and political rights, they've read into it an interpretation of human dignity, and they've used that to bring under the ambit of the right to life, the right to education, the right to health, the right to um, housing. And so, you know, as international attorneys, if, if you practice in the field of human rights, that's one way to look, up, look at it, that how can we take the judicial system and try to enforce ESCR, given, you know, if it is justiciable, fantastic, if not, find innovative ways to overcome that. And there's also been a proliferation of cases in um, Latin America and South Asia, to a lesser degree in Europe, North America, the Philippines and some African countries. And while we are considering developments in the international level, the international dimension of ESCR adjudication should not be, um, should not be ignored. For example, um, there have been many decisions made by committees, made by a different um, uh, regional bodies that have shaped domestic interpretation of ESCR and has really helped to advance ESCR in the field. So for example, the decision of the European Committee on Social Rights on Exploitative Child Labour had a huge impact on how this works in practice in Portugal. Or for instance, in Serac versus Nigeria, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights have are notable for the articulation of the obligations of African states um, under economic, social, and cultural rights. These have not been implemented, right? It's largely not been implemented. However, it did provide a key guiding standard for the continent and follow-up litigation in Nigeria. 
even the International Court of Justice has brought in decisions on, the, on economic, social, and cultural rights. For example, they held the State of Israel, um, they held that the State of Israel violated ICSIA and the, the Children's Rights Convention um, by the construction of the security fence and its associated regime. And beyond kind of the international bodies that we've talked about, the UN mechanisms that you've seen this morning, the regional bodies, you also have other avenues. For example, there is um, increasingly civil society has intervened in international investment arbitration disputes, which sounds very boring, but has a huge impact on economic and social rights often. Um, the World Bank has an inspection panel that um, allows people that have been impacted by the bank's projects to um, come before it. There's the OECD multinational enterprises complaint procedures. So these are also some of the lesser well-known, but they have an impact and they have made very interesting uh, decisions on housing rights, on environment um, degradation, and um, should be considered as well. Now this is not all to say that enforcement works fantastically well. Yes, there are decisions, and often these lead to actual concrete change. Often they don't. And also, a lot of countries have still not constitutionalized the rights with justiciable effect. And some jurisdictions, even where you have these rights in the constitution, there are still political, philosophical, conservative concerns that these rights are essentially in the domain of the legislature, that courts should be very restrained while dealing with them. So there is this issue to consider when you're thinking about normative developments, um, developments in legal enforcement in this field. So, um, and this is despite that the Committee on the Economic Social Rights has in general comment number nine really urged states um, to, to implement ESCR through actual concrete legislation and have also made specific recommendations to states such as the United Kingdom, Canada and China in the course of periodic review that make these rights justiciable. It will really help breathe life into your state obligations under this convention. Now let's look at the trends in legal jurisprudence, right? There are some trends that cut across international, regional, and domestic application of law. Um, so one of the big achievements has been achievements in relation to the justiciability debates. Now, when you look at the covenants, you read the rights, right? But when you go out there and you try to make these rights enforceable through your domestic courts, through other kinds of forums, one of the first arguments that you will often hear is that these rights are essentially, um, they are essentially political in nature. They should be decided by legislators, they should be decided by the people. Judges do not have the institutional competence to deal with these types of cases. This has been a huge barrier to legalizing ESCR rights with enforceable effect in national jurisdictions. But however, with the international bodies, with regional bodies, with national bodies really kind of um, bringing in ESCR to civil and political rights, effectively doing so, effectively enforcing change in a very concrete way with um, the international bodies kind of influencing conversations at the national levels which has led to ESCR becoming justiciable through constitutions, this is a largely moot debate now, but this has been a huge, huge achievement in the field. And one of the others is on the normative content of ESCR, right? So you see the right to housing, you see the right to health, but what does it really mean? What are the parameters of that right, right? So the court cases, international observations by you know, different committees, different um, treaty bodies, different charter bodies, has led to an evolution on what ESCR actually means. Now, as per the CSR, or the Committee on Economic Social Rights, each right carries a bundle of claims. Say if you take the right to education, right? So you have accessibility, availability, adequacy, and appropriateness, right? Cultural, and then when courts will look 
at whether the right to education has been violated or not, they will look, has the state party made this right, has made education accessible? Have they, is it of a particularly decent quality? They will look at these particular criteria to determine whether there has been a violation. Now, various approaches have been adopted by adjudicatory bodies on what constitutes normative content. Um, we don't have to go into detail on this, but some courts have said, look, this is for state legislators to, to decide. We will just kind of not talk about normative content. So they, will, they don't entirely explain on what basis do they reach their decision. They just will say, in our understanding and according to the Constitution, the state has been unreasonable, right? But they will not say, OK, the right to health means X, Y, Z. Some courts go into more detail. I mean, uh, South Africa has, in some instances, India has. Um, in this one case in the US, in the Supreme Court of Kentucky, they really went into what the right to education means. And of course, the committees really helped develop both through their, the individual complaints, the decisions that they issue, but also through the general comments and other types of forums, what um, constitutes normative content. Now, when we look at different developments in international and comparative law, let us look at these through the lens of obligations developed by the CESR, um, the obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill. And in addition, there are three areas we need to look at. The cross-cutting normative standards that have been developed by this body of adjudication, conflict between rights, and developments in remedies. So under the obligation to respect, as we talked about, this refers to abstaining from interference. And such violations are actually widely reported on. And some predict that they will form the majority of cases under the optional protocol on the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, there are a significant number of cases under this category, which runs through all levels, international, regional, and national. For example, um, the Supreme Court of Argentina, in, um, in the Aquino case in 2004, they struck down a 1995 law which severely circumscribed basic entitlements for injured and ill workers. And they said that this violates the right to respect workers' rights, and it violates a whole range of international standards, including the ICESCR. The, Econ um, the European Court of Justice has um, taken the right to movement, which albeit is quite a, more of a civil and political right, and they have um, imbued it with socioeconomic character by striking down restrictions of access to social goods and services by non-nationals, right? And They've done this particularly in the area of education. So what they basically said, you look at, if we give the right to movement, you cannot bar non-nationals from accessing education based on their nationality. So, um, and this, like we talked about before, civil and political rights have been used, especially by a lot of the European forums and by domestic jurisprudence to bring in under their ambit economic and social and cultural rights. Now, I would love for a world where these rights would be completely justiciable on their own, but often they're not. So you have to look for innovative ways in which to make that happen. And another type of development that has come across in this field, that has happened in this field, is the harmonization and convergence of criteria that courts and other forums apply to determine a human rights violation, right? So when a court is trying to decide whether a right has been violated, they will apply certain criteria. So let's take the case of the right to housing. And the CSR, the, the Committee on Economic, Social, Culture and Rights, in general comment seven, has developed exhaustive criteria on forced evictions, right? So for example, people have to be given, there has to be procedural fairness. There has to be alternative accommodations if people do not have their own means to, to find or secure other housing. And these committee um, kind of criteria that was developed has been adopted explicitly adopted by the African Commission, 
by courts in Argentina, just for example. There are other jurisdictions that have taken similar approaches, South Africa and ECHR. Of course, certain unevenness does exist, but harmonization and convergence, just so we don't have you know, 10,000 different kind of um, standards out there, it is a very promising development that in the field of judicial enforcement, we are seeing a convergence of international standards and criteria and domestic standards and criteria. Another huge development and achievement, I would say, in the field of ESCR adjudication has been holding private actors accountable. Now, the UN system is very state-centric, as you know, but when you think about our world today, of the 100 most powerful economic entities, about 49 are multinational corporations. State companies have enormous power, and they can impact ESCR in a very major way, but they do not have the same systems of accountabilities that states have. International law is developing rapidly in this context, but not fast enough. So ESCR adjudication through state obligations has been able to find different ways to hold powerful private actors accountable. This has been a, a, a major shift in what used to happen and what happens now. And one of the ways they have done this is using the state obligation to protect. So to revise what we discussed before, um, the state obligation to protect means that the state has an obligation to protect people from any kind of interference of their enjoyment of rights, interference that is caused by a third party, whether it be an individual or an institution or a corporation. And there have been very interesting cases that have come under this um, particular obligation. For example, one second, yes. So the African Commission found that Nigeria has failed to ensure that the Shell oil company in the Delta region refrained from polluting natural resources such as water, air, land, as you know, these are very important for social rights, right? So, and Shell is a huge company. So they've used Nigeria's obligation to protect, to try and impact or try and change the course of how Shell operates in the region. The Inter-American Commission found that Belize had violated the rights of the Mayan people by granting logging and mining concessions to private companies without their consent and without any kind of consultation process. Again, they used the state obligation to protect, and they found that rights to equality, indigenous rights, and rights to property were violated. In Vishaka versus state of Rajasthan, India basically looked at cases of sexual harassment at work, including private workplaces. They drew on CEDAW guidelines to develop binding guidelines which would remain in force and applicable to private actors until appropriate legislation was adopted. And in a very interesting case decided by CEDO, 80 versus Hungary, the committee looked at the issue of domestic violence, right? So think about this. This is actually an issue that has occurred in the private realm. And the committee found that the legal and social protections available to the complainant a victim of domestic violence was grossly inadequate and they said that the state has to take stronger steps to protect victims of domestic violence and also give support to this particular victim and develop law to protect domestic violence victims in general. Now, um, another issue that we won't go into in detail but is very important is, as you know, privatization can have an impact on the enjoyment of economic and social rights, especially by, for example, poorer communities. And a lot of um, committees at the UN have expressed their concern about the impact of privatization processes on the poor. Um, you have a lot of um, civil society-driven advocacy campaigns against privatization, 
but courts have really not taken on this issue and this goes back perhaps to some of the philosophical issues you were talking about earlier. Courts continue to demonstrate some sort of reticence when it comes to um, really interfering with the state's policy choices, especially in areas like the economy. Um, to move on to the obligation to fulfill, um, this is again a very big development because it's one thing to tell states that don't discriminate, you know, respect rights, etc. It's another to tell states to take wide-ranging actions. And international bodies have, but national courts have also started to take on this very directive role, telling states that where certain policies or where there's certain policy vacuums on important economic, social, and cultural rights, courts have directed states. <coughs> that we would like you to meet your obligation in these very specific ways, right? This is, for example, saying you have to develop legislation on, say, maternal health. And um, so this is one area, but there is still a sort of unease regarding courts compelling state action. Ireland is one state jurisdiction where this is um, <coughs> particularly an issue. Now, when dealing with the obligation to fulfill, <coughs> sorry, there are two aspects of obligation that's, that courts and judicial and quasi-judicial bodies at the international, regional, and national levels look at. These are what we've discussed before, that states have to take progressive steps within budgetary constraints, <coughs> but that certain minimum essential levels of rights have to be met. So for example, the Colombian court has taken on both of these um, and they have used it to tell states, sure, we understand budget restraints, but these are certain minimum, um, a minimum core of rights that you have to meet and they've used this to issue orders, for example, on the right to health that requires wide ranging steps to be taken by the state in law and policy. Finland is another country that uses this approach. South Africa, thank you so much. South Africa will look at whether the state has taken progressive steps, but it will not tell the state, it will not compel the state through orders to meet a particular minimum within a particular time frame. The Constitutional Court of Hungary does the opposite. It needs to see a particular minimum that's been met, so it needs to see that a particular law or policy is in place, but it won't go further than that. It will not examine in detail whether enough progressive steps have been taken to meet an obligation. <coughs> Sorry. And the Inter-American Court does enforce minimum social rights, but only through civil and political rights. Switzerland has an interesting approach as well in this area. The Swiss Federal Court will derive an implied constitutional right to say basic minimum necessities and while they will not, while they will explicitly say that look we lack the competence to say how the state decides its budget, they will hold the state in violation of the constitution if the state does not meet certain minimum standards. So, um, and South Asian courts have also under this obligation to fulfill given very, very wide-ranging orders about what a state should or should not do. Now, this might be an argument to, <coughs> to talk about whether judicial legislating is a good thing. It is a way of really giving effect to the international standards that we've seen today, but can they be going too far? If you think about it, courts cannot be held accountable in the democratic way, right, in many countries. So this is also a debate that Sure, courts should have the power to very strongly enforce ESCA, but how far should judicial activism go? How far should expanding and elaborating rights go in a way that meets democratic needs? This is a critique. It's not one I agree with, but it's out there, and I want you to know it. Another is the area of equality rights, right? So we again talked about civil and political rights, and this really brings it into focus. Equality and non-discrimination in the areas of health, housing, education 
has been um, really used to bring in um, economic, social, and cultural rights enforcement, both again at the international level by decisions on the UN Human Rights Committee, by the European Court of Human Rights, and in national jurisdictions like Canada, France, Bulgaria, Pakistan, etc. The jurisprudence looks at the international standards, so you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race and color, on the basis of sex, on the basis of language and religion, but other forums have developed other grounds, such as age, disability, nationality, sexual orientation. So this is an important area to look at. Another area of development, as you can understand, when so many different courts and forums are adjudicating, <coughs> is that a, diff a number of normative standards and principles that are overarching, right, have come into being and help courts and forums and judicial and quasi-judicial bodies to actually analyze whether there has been a violation and whether they can hold a state accountable. Now, as you can see, there are general constitution principles such as legitimate expectations. So if you suddenly cut somebody's social security payments, <coughs> a court can come in and say, no, wait a minute. This person has for years, this has been the one policy. People have a legitimate expectation. You cannot just suddenly take away a source of income without some kind of um, support system. <coughs> Non-discrimination and equality we've talked about. There's also reasonableness, which is a very important area of norm very important normative standard, and we will go into it in detail. Um, there's proportionality. So for example, in a case in Brazil that looked at affirmative action for students that belong to communities that have historically been discriminated against, they said that in the efforts to ensure racial equality, it is proportional to have affirmative action schemes, right? What would not be proportional, for example, if you just ban students from other communities from coming to college, that would be non-proportional. But proportionality, whether the interests of your particular, that you're trying to meet through a particular action is balanced out proportionately with the rights that you are obliged to fulfill. There's human dignity. Human dignity is the core of economic, social, and cultural rights. It is used by almost every single forum. People's dignity has to be respected, therefore XYZ measure has to be taken. There's a minimum level of existence, which has basically been influenced by <coughs> minimum core, like we talked about, the minimum essential levels of rights. Germany, uh, in Germany, this is a very, very primary uh, principle that they follow. There's a margin of appreciation. Now you've heard about how, how states find it difficult to sometimes meet all of these human rights obligations and the margin of appreciation says, sure, states have these particular obligations, but there is a margin of appreciation that allows states a particular amount of discretion in social and economic choices that they are making. Now, we won't have time to go into all of these, but we will talk a little bit more in detail on reasonableness because it is used very, very extensively by different forums. The reasonable standard is a test which asks whether the decision was legitimate and designed to clearly remedy a certain issue. Was it fair? Did it balance the interests making the decision against the rights to be protected? Was the state acting in a reasonable manner? And this has been used by many different jurisdictions to adjudicate an ESCL. For example, in Argentina, discriminatory regulation requiring immigrants to provide prove 20 years of residency to become eligible for disability pension was struck down as unreasonable. Um, and in the absence of harmonized domestic understandings and the use of the standard of reasonableness, it's interesting to know that under the optional protocol, the one that we talked about, the optional protocol to the ICESCR, uh, reasonableness has been included as a standard. So CSR shall consider the reasonableness of the steps taken by the state party in accordance with the rights laid out by the CSR. Um, the margin of appreciation is, some, is, an, um, is a standard that is used a lot by the European Court of Human Rights. 
So it might be particularly interesting for you. It allows, as we talked about, a discretionary latitude that authorities have in reaching certain goals. And it, um, it can be used not just to defend certain decisions that don't go the full way, but also to defend positive decisions, right? So for example, in um, Malta, um, the government had um, put in um, effect rent control and requisition, and this was challenged at the European Court of Human Rights, and they used this margin of appreciation principle to say that the, gov the government has discretion in this area because they were trying to ensure just distribution of housing resources in a country where land, land resources are very minimal. So because they had this particular goal, they have the margin of appreciation to take certain steps. And it's interesting that um, this standard was developed by ECHR jurisprudence and has been largely adopted by state parties to the ECHR in their domestic jurisprudence. And after, although it's considered to be a slightly conservative principle, even though it's been used to protect social rights very extensively, it's still considered conservative because it's very differential to states in a way. So during the negotiations when standards were being developed for the optional protocol of the ICESCR, um, they did debate whether they should include this as a standard for appraisal or not and ultimately they decided against it. Then we also have the conflict between rights. Um, we won't go deeply within this, but there can be conflict between, say, civil and political rights and ESCR. What does the field do then? So the body of adjudication has led to certain standards and ways in which this conflict is dealt with. So for example, in France and Bangladesh, they, it was between freedom of expression and the right to health. So basically, they restricted tobacco advertising because they, and doing so, they infringed on the freedom of expression, but they did it because they were wanting to protect the right to health. Um, Canada, on the other hand, said, no, we are not going to, um, to uh, kind of infringe on the freedom of expression. However, now the situation has turned and they do allow certain restrictions on tobacco um, advertising. And then there's conflicts between various economic, social, and cultural rights. These are very difficult, and you will see them in different committee decisions. One of the cases which really brings it out is a case in India where they needed to build a dam. This would have given communities and villages a huge number of people access to water and sanitation, but it also means that people who are situated on the water body where the, ba where the dam was supposed to be built on the river had to be resettled. And the way laws work out in India, it's basically taking away the right to housing because often resettlements don't work out in practice. So you have the right to housing versus the right to water. Which one do you give, which one do you give weight to? And in this case, the Indian Supreme Court did a complete cop out and they basically said, well, we defer to the state. Let the state decide. So um, these are issues that crop up all the time and jurisprudence developed has helped um, the field understand and how to deal with this kind of conflict. But one of the very interesting areas, one of the huge developments in this field and achievements in this field has been in the area of remedies and enforcement. Now like we talked about, these are case decisions that are being made, but are they being implemented, right? Are committee decisions being implemented? Are Supreme Court decisions at the national level being implemented? The Inter-American Court says X, Y, Z. What happens? Do we see concrete change in the ground? Now there are political aspects to enforcement that we'll talk about later, but there are also remedies that courts can use or there, there's ways of fashioning orders that courts can use to make enforcement more feasible. So you could have mandatory orders. Um, so here, for example, um, some courts, both you know, at all levels, issue orders requiring states to follow a very specific course of action. Sometimes they maintain supervisory jurisdiction which means that the courts actually retain jurisdiction to monitor 
actual implementation. They ask the state to come back to report on them. Um, so this is supervisory jurisdiction. Sometimes they even give a time schedule. So you have to comply with this particular order within XYZ amount of time. Um, for example, in Argentina, there was a particular, uh, it is called the Argentine hemorrhagic fever and it threatened 3.5 million residents. And the courts provided very strong mandatory orders um, in ensuring that the authorities complied with their plans and budget to provide a vaccine in a very timely manner. Um, also, advocates have been creative in securing follow-up orders for ensuring that orders are implemented with. So they use contempt of court proceedings in certain cases. So say a government authority has been ordered to do X in the area of housing policy. They don't do it. They could go to jail. They have, may have to pay a fine. In South Africa and India, contempt of court proceedings have been initiated multiple times against a particular ministers and government authorities high up. This is usually in jurisdictions where authorities, for some reason, it might be capacity, it might be the political situation, um, but are unwilling or unable to implement orders. Now, this is a very adversarial, a very hostile approach for the court to take, right? They're directly going up against the state authorities. This is not usually in the best interest of protecting rights. The best interests of protecting rights happen when all concerned parties, the government, civil society, courts, you know, communities work together in a collaborative way. So courts are cognizant of this. So there's another trend that we see in, in um, international, regional, and national jurisprudence, which is dialogic and interim remedies, right? So for some, one example is the increased use of delayed declarations of invalidity. The courts and the committees, they talk or they engage in dialogue with the government. They give them time to fix the particular wrongdoing before they become adversarial and issue a decision against the government. For example, um, in Elridge versus British uh, Columbia in Canada, this was one of the approaches that was used to remedy legislative or policy defect. In Nepal, there was a very anti-woman property law passed, but rather than coming down with a hammer, they told the government, look, we feel that you are in violation of XYZ international standards. Please go back, review the law, talk, consult with affected parties, especially women's rights organization, and come back, and we will again look at this issue at the courts in a year. And this kind of leads to a less acrimonious relationship between courts and, and governments, which in the long run can actually better help enforce ESCR. Um, you also have the dialogic aspect. So increasingly, the adjudicatory space is being used by courts to allow different parties to talk together. It creates a safe space for them to come together and talk. And um, the courts urge them to find a final solution before the decision is actually issued. And then you have the two-track remedies. Instead of giving one really extensive final order, what courts do is they issue certain interim remedies, and then the state comes back, they report, and then the final remedy might be much less extensive or less acrimonious than was previously thought would be necessary. And it also allows for the critique to be addressed that when courts um, provide nothing, you know, give this very long-term kind of declaratory orders, victims don't get anything in the short term. So by short-term interim orders, victims receive some amount of immediate help, which can be of great value. So these are some of the... Um, some of the remedial achievements that have been developed in this field. So now we've looked at a lot of trends, a lot of achievements, and a lot of developments in the field of judicial enforcement. And I promise I will wrap up soon. You all look very tired. So we are going to end with the discussion of the issue of achieving impact. Now in 1969, Richard Bilder basically assessment, he said, 
that despite the great increase of international human rights efforts, the condition of man has been basically unchanged for the last 20 quarter of a century. And if you think about it, you read human rights reports today, you look at the news, it, is, it probably still holds true today that while there has been enormous progress in human rights efforts, in what we are able to do to address violations, actual concrete change in the ground is a long way from, long way from an ideal state, right? An ideal situation. One of the strongest objections to ESCR adjudication is that it cannot fulfill the expectations of delivering transformative social justice. But courts can rarely do that. International organizations can rarely do this. Courts have a limited role, sure, but transformative social change happens through a multitude of different avenues. So just kind of looking at courts and saying, oh, the lack of enforcement is this huge deal, um, is something to think about. But it is also a substantive critique of the field. Enforcement is a problem in many jurisdictions. Um, another issue or critique is that often when we're trying to build a social movement because the violations of ESCR are so huge, it distracts. When you have a, when you have a, a court victory, you know, it dissipates energy, so on and so forth. Another is that courts actually tend to protect the rights of the middle class more than they do that of the poor. So these are some of the critiques that we see in terms of impact. But in response to this critique, three things can be said. First, there is emerging evidence that many, but certainly not all, um, that certainly not, um, sorry, cases have had a direct and indirect impact. This is by setting judicial precedent. This is by influencing legal and policy changes. This is by actually engendering concrete change in the ground, whether it is giving hundreds of thousands of mothers access to medicines that they need, or it's changing a dysfunctional health system, or it is stopping environmental degradation of the lands of indigenous communities. There is substantial change happening. Um, they can catalyze and inspire activists to work further on these issues. And a study that was done of five countries, um, the researchers found that courts legalizing demands for socioeconomic rights may well have averted thousands of deaths and enriched the lives of millions of others. And it is, so this is one way of looking at it. It is a limited role. Enforcement is limited. But there is still a lot of positive impact that happens through ASIA adjudication. And often it's not even that the case decision leads to change, right? For example, when the African Commission ruled, on Niger ruled against Nigeria, against Shell, it created space for people being affected to work with the company and try and find solutions. So you can't just see, okay, this is the final decision. Has it been met to the letter? You have to see certain other types of um, policy changes that are triggered by cases, right? And um, finally, you know, just to kind of wrap up, we have to look at the concept of transferability. We have these rich decisions at the international and regional levels. We have these normative standards, these very innovative procedural um, standards that have been developed in the courts in different countries. And certainly countries can learn from each other, so there can be horizontal transferability from the international and the local between each other. And then there can be, sorry, that's vertical. And then there can be horizontal transferability where courts learn from each other, and they have, they often do refer, you know, international decisions will talk about legal developments in local jurisdictions and vice versa. However, sometimes it's limited because there can be certain um, factors that come into play when you're deciding a course at a particular forum that is not always transferable. So we can talk about that. Um, another um, issue to talk about in conclusion is the importance of the global and local dynamic, right? So it's about the international systems working with the local systems to optimize enforcement of ESCR. 
Um, I'll give you an example. It's a small example, and it's just one tiny aspect of it. And it's based on the United States. Um, in Chicago, there was torture being reported against death row victims. And nothing was happening at the domestic level because death row victims have no public sympathy. So, you know, activists were trying to talk about torture being a problem, this should be stopped, nothing happened. But then people, being, uh, family members of affected people went and they presented before the committee of torture. And the committee of torture gave, you know, their observations that torture is being committed in the US, this is against international standards, X, Y, Z. This was reported in international media and the State Department was like, you know, they're reading headlines that say, oh, the US is in violation of international standards and they come into Chicago and they make massive changes. This is just one tiny example of how the global and local can impact. There's of course using the, the standards and the content of international decisions in local decisions. There's many other standards, but enforcement has been seen to be very strong where the global and local dynamic is strong. And finally, several factors, right? To look at if several factors lead to the success or failure of enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. If, of course, there is inclusion of these rights in constitutional or other enforceable legislation, if there are broad-based social movements, that's good. It really helps enforcement. For example, in, in South Africa, there was a very strong decision given in the case of Groot Boom on the right to housing. Seven years passed before there was any kind of proper enforcement done. However, in another right to health case where there were social movements kind of sustaining the pressure and the momentum and, and running with the decision once it was issued, impact was found to be much greater. So social movements matter. And finally, a very important factor is optimal institutional configuration. In a particular country or even in terms, if you're thinking about the international level, do people have access to justice? So there is a committee. How does a person in a village, in a particular country, actually bring their case to the attention of international forums? How do they even go to the capital of their own country to access legal? Are these avenues easy? Some countries can have extremely difficult standing rules that, you know, as a person whose rights are being violated, I just don't have the way to navigate. So this is an issue. Capacity is an issue. Remember in Groot Boom, we talked about seven years passing before any enforcement. This was because they couldn't figure out where the locus of responsibility was within the government. And of course, there can be many other capacity issues. And in terms of international recommendations, sometimes states just do not have the technical ability to meet some of these obligations. There is the orientation of the adjudicators what is their, you know, are they more conservative in terms of ESCR? Are they more progressive? This matters. Independence of adjudicator matters. Even social and political history can matter. So given all of this, um, we need to acknowledge that when we're thinking about enforcement, you can't think about it in simple terms. It's extraordinarily complex. However, in our comparative survey today of ESCR adjudication, we see a field in flux between nascence and maturity. And despite its limitations, it has really helped advance the actual protection of ESCR on the ground. And in countries as diverse as China, Egypt, Namibia, United States, Colombia. And so it is exciting the way the field is developing. And hopefully you all will work on some aspects of it someday and make it even more rich. So thank you. I'm going to stop here.